Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm taking a moment um, to take in all these names. I'm so happy to see so many uh, familiar names and faces and newcomers as well. So wonderful to be with you. I'm Rabbi Lisa Rubin. I know many of you already uh, from Central Center for Exploring Judaism. I'm here today with one of our center's former students, uh, Izu Mukantabana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Izu, uh, a Rwandan Jewish and queer woman who is more accomplished uh, than anyone here can even imagine, an author, a creative director, an advocate um, in the social realm and the arts world. We are so lucky to be speaking to you today, Izu, about a book that you co-wrote, Real Friends Talk About Race, Bridging the Gaps Through Uncomfortable Conversations. And of course, I hope today will not be as uncomfortable as it will be informative and a chance for all of us to encounter not only the very special person um, that I think that you are, but the timely, oh, so important subject that you write about. So welcome. It's wonderful to see you. And just to share with a larger audience, Izu and I were speaking um, before all of you came on that it was about a year ago um, that Izu decided to formally become Jewish. It was a year before that, that she and I met in my office for an initial conversation. And who would have thought two years later, we would be here um, woman to woman having this very important conversation. So Izu, let's start. You have had quite um, an interesting geographical journey that obviously informs your views of identity. Will you just share a bit with our listeners today about your background, moving around where yeah. you landed, and it, it'll help us understand why you know this is so important to you. Yes, of course. So um, as Rabbi Ruben said, my name is Isa Poflit Mukan Havana. I grew up in Belgium mostly when I was younger, but I, I was born in Burundi, which is a neighboring country to Rwanda. Uh, but I am Rwandan. Um, and then um, maybe 15 years ago, I moved to the U.S. Uh, I went to college uh, in New Jersey. Then I moved to New York. And now I'm, I'm between uh, New York and Paris um, as of very recently. Um, as Rabbi Ruben said, I am queer. Um, and I do my best to intersect all my identities uh, in everything that I do. I'm very much in a creative space, but also uh, always connected to advocacy, always connected to something that means something to someone, um, because it just feels like it's important to have depth in whatever I want to uh, get into. And recently, uh, officially an author of a book that I hope you guys will buy and like. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I loved it. Um, and I said to you before, love is a strange word. And you pointed out, right, because you can fall out of love. But I found the book um, profoundly eye-opening. Um, mm -hmm. Tell us for a moment about your friendship, um, the co-author yeah. of this book, Hannah Summerhill, and the group that spawned the writing of this book. Why was this book important uh, for you to write and you to write with Hannah? Yeah, so Hannah and I met in a co-working space meant for only women. And uh, we were invited at a at an event that was actually speaking about how to, how to, um, how to, oh my God, I'm having a brain. Uh, how to fix the gap between uh, women of color and uh, white women. And so um, we were both there that day, but the conversation was very odd to me because it was predominantly white women that were present. Um, I like the spirit of the conversation, but most the the setting of the conversation was that people could come in and, and, and participate in the conversation, kind of like a fishbowl. Um, the host was amazing. The guests, the official guests were amazing. So anyone could come in and really like participate in a conversation. It just happened that like the majority of people that were there were white women. And the the only people that were choosing to come in and to participate in the conversation were women, women of color. 
Um, and so I thought that was really odd because here we have an opportunity to have a conversation and it felt very voyeuristic. And so um, I decided, hey, like I'm going to participate, but I'm not going to add on the trauma that's being graciously shared by women of color in this group. I'm going to call out the obvious that I thought it was just not, it didn't feel genuine. It didn't feel right that these women were just sitting there sharing and like white women were not like participating and just watching and 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 not really like involving themselves. And so I called it out and um, Hannah came to me after and was like, hey, that really spoke to me. You called out something that really made sense. And I uh, would love to meet up and like, you know, have become friends basically and mm -hmm. so we decided to 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 meet up after that and she had taken the initiative of continuing this conversation in her in her living room so she wanted to have people over uh women of color or or white women to come and to have these difficult and uncomfortable conversation I came to one and then I was traveling for a few months for like three months in Israel so I basically just physically was there for one. And then after that, like I, I continued to receive emails from her showing that she continued the conversation, which I thought was really cool because, okay, it didn't feel like she was trying to like check the box or feed the discomfort that she felt initially. She was genuinely interested in having this conversation. And so when I came back, I offered her, hey, like what if we put this out as in a podcast form and we invite people um, We've had mostly women from all type of background, uh, but from minorities and Jewish women to come in and to talk on uh, who they are and to humanize the narrative, basically, that seems to be lost in just like explaining the dynamics that exist, the racial dynamic that exists in um, the world and in America specifically. And so we did that for a few. And then our podcast gained a lot of success. Uh, we were featured best podcast in Elle magazine and Mary Claire. So it grew into a thing. Um, and it was right before the racial reckoning that we experienced during COVID. And uh, so people were kind of like, oh, wow, you guys were doing this before. Everyone was kind of like, oh, we should talk about this. And so we were invited to uh, host conversations and private spaces uh, or uh, corporate spaces. So we created a company where we we did consulting. And then someone approached us, uh, our, our, actually not someone, our book uh, agent approached us, Tess, and said, hey, do you guys want to write a book about this? Um, for me, it wasn't like a, I had never met, I, first of all, I have a fear, I had a fear of writing. So because I learned a, a lot of languages at the same time, I, had, I like writing was absolutely like terrifying to me which is so contradictory to writing a book and also the studies that I did, which were communication. And my innocent brain at the time in college thought, oh, communication, I'm just going to be speaking a lot. I'm not going to be writing. So I majored in communication and ended up having one or two classes of public speaking and the rest was just like writing. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, here I am writing and I hate writing. I'm scared of writing. I hated math and writing was like scary to me, but I ended up writing a lot. And I used my degree actually to write this book because I studied communication. It's interpersonal communication. So it's basically explaining and predicting people's attitude towards like on an interpersonal level in different kind of like background professional, like interpersonal intimate. So I used a lot of the things that I actually, you know, learned in college to be able to, to have these perspective for this book, which I'm happy I can tell my parents that my communication degree didn't yes. go to waste, <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, and so basically that's how we started writing this book. I was a little apprehensive because Hannah is such a, you know, she's such a, uh, an amazing advocate and she does a lot of work to be an incredible uh, ally but, you know, working towards becoming an ally um, means you're not going to be perfect. And so that receiving end means like I have to be witness or like the direct receiver of this imperfection, which I understand, but also means emotionally it's a lot to take in. So I we had a conversation and try to figure out like, are we are you sure you want to have this conversation? Are you sure you want to write this book? Are you ready? 
and she was ready and so we started um yes the podcast is still available someone asked uh it's called kinswoman podcast sorry um and so that's how we started the book and then we started the book with one premise is we will speak to our own voice. So the book is set up where we each speak on our own and not as one union sin. Because I think that like every time we have, you know, people coming together to have these conversations from different background or from different like, you know, um, racial, racially, or maybe queer, not queer, whatever, a lot of the times people feel like in order to make it, to convey the conversation, we, we really have to like speak as a we. And it's like, that's not, I don't think it's necessary. We can have different opinions and we can have different views. The goal is that we create a space that's fertile for a greater thinking and to evolve and to grow and to learn from one another. And so like, that's what was really important for me and for her as well, that we have our own voice in the book. So we give space for people to see themselves uh, in different places from me or from her. Yes. And I appreciate that. And I appreciated also, not only did you have your own voice, you had your own font. So I always yeah. knew who I was reading, but, you know, to, to read um, the two of you sometimes in direct dialogue to each other, but most of the time, just speaking, like you said, from your experience, your background mm -hmm. about the same topic. And it is important in dialogue to remember, we don't have to agree. And the point of true dialogue um, in Judaism, especially the chevruta, the two friends who sit together mm -hmm. to study, is solely for the advantage of having someone with a different opinion um, than mm -hmm. you and learning how to get there, um, you know, in, in different ways. Yeah. So reading this book it, as a rabbi, as I mentioned to you, I was reading, you know, with a Jewish lens and several things came up uh, for me. So the first several times in the book, you specifically wrote that you were taught from a young age by your parents, by your aunts, to know where you're going, you have to remember where mm -hmm. we're from, right? Mm -hmm. This struck me as a very uh, Jewish idea. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. um, if, you know, after your um, conversion or now, does it ring true to you, not only in the realm of racial conversations, but now in religious ones also? Yeah, of course. I think that it's really important to if we have the the privilege, like the opportunity to know our background or like to know where we, from what we are made, basically, mm -hmm. um, it's important to be able to like, to to dive in it and to, to like sit in it and to like, I really believe in that. Like m m I was taught that, but like it had a different meaning as I grew older. Like when I was little, I thought it was like a physical place. It's like, don't forget that you're African. Don't forget where you're from uh, physically. And then as I grow older and I, you know, have my own experience, I re realized that like knowing where you're from is not necessarily like a physical place, but it's also where we are me mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And so what really guides us towards movement is going to be give ourselves grace that that we are coming from somewhere it's not just like we've appeared and it just happens it's like we open the door to like the possibility of a journey and and I think that like allyship is very much about a journey and I speak about it as a journey and and continuous journey that really doesn't have an end but always like you know I I consider myself on my own journey of allyship towards groups that I'm not part of but I would like to like be there for and so knowing where I'm from is really first of all giving me giving myself grace of growth and also knowing that movement is possible. I'm not stuck in a place. I'm not stuck in an idea. I'm not stuck in like a truth. I can always evolve into something, um, something different, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You no, know, very, very important. And, you know, parallel to Judaism, taking, you know, a look back makes for a very healthy path forward. But if we don't understand, if we don't go through, you know, this, the entire premise of the high holidays to reflect mm -hmm. and how are we going to better ourselves and how are we going to grow? Not if we're going to better ourselves mm -hmm. or if we're going to grow, but how, right? It's just built into our tradition. So I mm -hmm. really liked the way you framed it. Let's, let's go. I want to pick up on something you said about being an ally. Mm -hmm. So you and Hannah write a lot in this book about what it means um, to mm -hmm. be an ally. And there are so many good intentioned people out there, but obviously this is 
you know, racial tension, this is still a, a huge problem and the inequality yeah. and the history. What discourages people um, from being, you know, good allies? What do you think derails their journey, their well-meaning yeah. journey? I think it's uh, mostly from what I've I've seen. So like the book is meant for people that are like genuinely good, like good people, you know, like I personally have never met like a KKK member or like extreme right person like I don't meet people like that so it's I'm, I'm really talking to for the average normal good person that cares about their cares about things that matters to them and so coming from there it's like I give the the benefit of the doubt that like I'm speaking to someone that can hear me and so I think that most of the time people are really afraid of making a mistake or not getting everything right, or not like, um, you know, have the, the idea of perfection is really uh, debilitating for a lot of people. And so what I really wanted to emphasize in the book is that like, there's no such thing as perfection. And it's actually really um, anti-growth to think that you are supposed to be perfect. And it's more so of like, what happens when you make, you make a mistake? Like what happens when you don't know something? that is the most important thing to me and for allyship is very much about learning how to embrace the the discomfort that that brings uh that it's going to be uncomfortable but it's also an opportunity to grow it's not like a a dead end and like um something that like brings an end to everything or to life because like the idea of discomfort i speak of that a few times in the book and for the book and like just in general is like when we're really uncomfortable it's a physical thing it it shows up physically yes. it shows up mentally we feel like the ground under our feet is literally opening up and we're going to fall in a hole like it's a real thing to be uncomfortable and i think that when we learn that discomfort won't kill you and like you you're just not going to fall in any hole sitting in that space of discomfort becomes more um, possible. And then the growth is able to happen. And so I I think that like, yeah, most people are, are scared to be uncomfortable and they're scared to not be perfect. And perfection has been and is an absolute obstacle for a lot of people to do something like. And so I really push people to do things, not in a, I'm going to fix the world, because unfortunately, like, I know I wrote the book about, you know, uh, friendships and, and race and, and racial issues, but I know that this book is not going to fix everything, but it's really to chip in to the, the humanity that we need in order to address these issues. And that means like learning from our neighbors. That means like speaking into our schools. That means addressing things in our, you know, spiritual spaces. It really, it's, it's so much more specific than our, than what is presented to the world. Like a lot of the time, this is grandiose saviorism that's presented when we talk about allyship, which in reality, that's just not how things work. Like things work in a very specific way. Like that's how we find each other to be the same people, the same, no matter who we are, the specific interaction, the specific experiences is what brings us together. And so I, I, I push people to, you know, have conversation with your mom, if that's the person that you feel the most comfortable with. Uh, to begin and then broader to the school, to your workplace. And then it becomes to part of organization. And it's a ripple effect of, of an energy that's needed to make things, greater things move and change. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. And it sounds like you would tell people, you know, one thing at a time, right? Yes. Don't, don't let the enormity of the task, you know, overwhelm you rather, you know, one step at a time. Tell me um, about this. You you wrote, and again, this struck me as so Jewish. It is not enough to not be racist. You need to be anti-racist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You you know from our classes, we teach a very similar thing. Like you said, our shared humanity. That in Judaism, it's not enough to not be bad. You have to be right. in pursuit of the good, right? Mm -hmm. So tell us what it means that it, that because everyone listening to you now would probably say we're not you know we're not racist right, right. you're saying right. that's not enough you're saying that's right. not enough you actually need to be anti-racist tell us what you mean by that how do we do that I think that like um 
I was having, I told you this, but I was having a conversation with a friend of mine uh, right before our conversation, or, or, or this chat. And I, it, it hit me that like the way I see allyship is basically it kind of like a translation of like what tikkun olam looks like. Mm-hmm. And tikkun olam is like, it doesn't lies only in like being a good person or being like, you know, a nice person or a good mother, a good father, a good brother, sister, whatever, it really means that you have to be actively working towards repairing or restoring something. And so that means that it's an it's a verb. It's an active uh, decision to do something. And that means like, I don't know, some people are, are in real estate, some people are lawyers or doctors or whatever. In all these spaces, racism exists and shows up in a society that's like, built off of white supremacy right and so it's educating yourself figuring out what that means what what this looks like because there's definitely people talking about it in your space in that space and then trying to figure out how you as an individual you are able to restore and repair and I think that a lot of the times when we speak of allyship a lot of people think that I used to say this before I could connect it to tikkun olam I used to say like, I don't care that people love me. Like, I really don't, I don't, I don't do this work for people to love me. I do this because I want people to do better so that our children collectively, our society collectively just isn't in the same type of um, mechanism and systematic like oppression, right? And so being able to do that, you're disconnected to having to feel personally connected to this person or personally connected to this cause. And that's why I would speak on like intersection and intersectional allyship. It's like Black communities and Jewish communities have to work together because we're under the same issue of anti-Semitism and racism against Asian people or Black people or um, brown people, whatever, is the same issue. It's the root. The root is the same. And so even if you don't like this person or this group or whatever, it's for the greater good of our community, the greater good of humanity. And it's and and it and I it just made so much sense that it's it's basically what it is. It's repairing and restoring and taking it on as an active duty. Uh, and not just because you care about me. Like I'd love for people to love me, but that's just not <laughs> right. that's not my motor, right. if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Well, you're saying racism, you know, you're framing it as injustice, which that is. Jews Absolutely. certainly, you know, respond to. We don't give Sadaka sure. or charity because we love to or we love the people oh. or out of compassion. It is an act of redistributing right? The resources and, and fairness and justness. So I like that framing. Um, yeah. And I'd like to stay on this bit about intersectionality um, mm-hmm. because you hold so many identities as we heard in the introduction, African and Jewish and queer and a female of color. You only you know, wrote about race here. Mm-hmm. However, you just mentioned all these intersectionality conversations that have become so prevalent now. How do your other identities present themselves, you know, in these chapters and specifically anti-Semitism, right? Mm -hmm. Because this community watching, you know, you here today, this is the Jewish version, right? So tell me about these things and and your identities and what's in play to be an advocate for all of these different communities. Yeah. I mean, I do bring up anti-Semitism and I use Jewish uh, identity as like, how does anti-Semitism find itself in these spaces? Um, Counting as anti-Semitism as part of the issue that we have to address. But I, it's, it's easy for me to intersect racism and and anti-Semitism because it's the same, it's, it's from the same root and it's from the same, uh, uh, ideology, right? Uh, It presents itself differently in history and how uh, people have experienced it, but it continues to exist and it continues to be present in our society in general. And so that's why it just makes sense for me to speak on, which is not something that I see often in spaces where we are talking about racism. Some people tend to leave it out because it's a, I don't know if it's like, I don't know if it's purposeful. Sometimes it's it's 
100%, I think, is based in ignorance and what the idea of a Jew is, right? And so, like, um, not understanding that, you know, I explain to people, and I think I bring it up in the book, that you, if you are a, a Jewish person and you go to shul and you have to have police officers, security at the door, there has, there's, it's not stemmed from nothing. Like no one wants, like there has to be a threat in order to have that type of security in place. And so there's a reality that we can't ignore that anti-Semitism is still very much alive. Um, and so I make it a point to intersect. It doesn't feel like I have to erase anything in order to have a conversation because it literally all is connected it's connected through history it's it's like the history in europe is connected to the history in america it's the same ideologies that that we've used in like in africa um you know in rwanda the the whole ideas that stemmed and nourished the genocide the genocides because there is a few in the 50s and 60s and 70s and, and 94 is the big one but there's been a lot of diasporas uh, throughout and so it stems from this ideology of like um the the science behind like what a body is supposed to look like what is that body means to be and it was because Rwanda was first colonized by Germany and Germany took these ideologies and used it on like Rwandan people. And so all of this is all connected. If we read things separately, we don't see it. But there are there is a clear connection to these different things and that we have to bring up and we have to have a conversation. And I don't see a world where someone is going to be racist to an Asian, a Black person or Hispanic person and like be cool with Jewish people. But it's just, it, that's just, right, right. that doesn't, ha it doesn't happen like that. Or like someone that's like, oh, I hate Jews, but like, I'm cool with Black people. That that doesn't make sense to me. Even if someone said that, it it's not true because it all stems from like the same ideology of like uh, discriminating someone, not liking yeah, someone based other. on like, their race or and their identity rather than just something concrete that they've done to them so yeah. the injustice is there and that's how I I connect everything yeah and I think it's wise it, look nothing happens in in the world world history in any sort of vacuum there is no isolationist I mean the fact that the Germans were the first to come in uh, to Rwanda and you know Germany's role certainly in the Jewish genocide um is, is a very strong connecting point I want to go back to the allyship that you were talking about. I actually hadn't heard that word, becoming an ally, but allyship. What does allyship mm -hmm. look like? And I appreciated in the book how um, you and Hannah both wrote about two different forms of allyship, performative allyship mm -hmm. and active allyship. Can you not only summarize you know, those two, but give us an anecdote maybe of each one and how performative you know, is so dangerous to the cause and active is so vital um, to the cause. Can you talk about those? Yeah, of course. I mean, performative is like sticking a sticker on your car and saying like, I want peace in the world. That's really nice. Like we all want that. Uh, that's performative. You're performing that like you're giving us a sight of like what you'd like us to see and believe of you. But um, active allyship means that you are in a way doing something. And I always go back to the, the thing that I did. I said earlier is that like doing something doesn't mean like literally being the superhero to anyone. A lot of minorities like like for example, a lot of Jews or like black people are already doing things in order to combat and to address uh, anti-Semitism or racism, right? Like people are, are already on the ground, like no one needs saving, but being part of something that's like working towards addressing these issues is being active, an active ally. And so it can be, um, uh, deciding to be part of like the school, uh, maybe your school, um parents uh gathering where you have conversations that are needed because there's things that are happening in your school and like being part of a conversation 
I don't think it's necessarily you fixing things. I really need people to stop thinking that they need to save anyone or they need to like fix anything, but they do have to be actively part of something. They have to stand and apply their belief basically. And um, it's almost like saying, uh, well, I love the environment and I really want to keep the environment, you know, to, I, I really want the environment to, to be saved. But then you don't recycle. You're not conscious about how you consume energy. You don't like, you don't, you're not doing anything that's active. So having a sticker where you're like, save the world is just not, it's not enough. Right. There's and, too much dissonance. Yeah. Much dissonance. And then also uh, to the idea of intersection, I, th- it's so important because I think that like, even when people really care about the, the, like, for example, if you care about animals, if you care about the planet, I think it's so much easier than like being part of like an organization that's like working towards like fighting against anti-Semitism, right? Because of these animals and this earth is not going to have a close relation. Like, you're not going to have a direct conversation with these with these beings where they're telling you, well, you know, this is not it. You, you can't do it like that, whatever. Where human beings can have this interactiveness. And so... I see a lot of people that are amazing advocates for for um, like amazing vegans because they care about the environment, but they don't know how to translate that into like human spaces. So it's not that like people don't know how to do it. I think that people are not willing to apply it in like situation where humans are involved. And so that's what people have to like unpack and discover. And also allyship is something that you add on. So uh, if you don't know anything about disability and we've had guests, for example, that spoke on disability, there's so much things that I didn't know uh, and I learned through them. And so being able to learn, to hear, to to like read about it, it made me more aware of like the reality of people that experience disability that mm-hmm. I had no, no like I was very ignorant too. And so from there, I decide what I want to do. Like, I can't say that I'm an ally to disabled people and not be like actively doing something in the realm of advocating for people that are disabled. And I think that that's that's the connection that we have to make with just not a sticker. It's just not enough to say that you're a good person. We have to see action to it. Right. Again, I, I'm I'm just hearing so much of your Judaism um, yeah. you know, come through, which is terrific, you know, for this audience. But you know, again, in Judaism, it is not enough to be good. That's what no. the rabbis say. You have to be in active pursuit of the good, because otherwise, the definition of good is just it, it's it's too low of a bar. Um, mm-hmm. And I hear you saying that, and you've used podcasts, you know, to further your message, and now this book, but. In many ways, I feel social media has allowed for that performative allyship. I mean, I don't know, share with us, you know, your opinion, social media helped or hurt the cause of becoming an ally. It's just made it so easy to be performative by changing your label. I don't know, I'm going to let you, you tell us what you think about it. We do speak of this in the book, but I think that social media is like a good and a bad, like it all depends how you decide to use it. Uh, some people are using it to be able to literally copy paste and show like, hey, I'm a good person, I care, but has there's nothing happening in the background. But then right. I think social media has created also a space where uh, uh, people that we don't we didn't know about or that we didn't know causes that were happening around the world, we're able to have a platform to reach as much people as possible. So I think it's like, how do you use social media and how does it pertain to like your 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 beliefs like your your beliefs and your action and so it's bad because a lot of people I I don't know if you guys remember but during the social reckoning at the at the beginning and all the protests at some point someone uh I don't remember who actually initiated this but it was like everyone started putting black black squares and it was so it was so silly because the they called it the blackout So people translated that as like putting a black square, but the blackout wasn't actually about putting a black square. It was about like filling our feeds with information that was needed about the things that were happening. And so because people were quick to want to be seen as like, I'm part of the blackout movement, 
um, they put they put black boxes, which worked against what was supposed to be happening. We're supposed to have a, a whole like a uh, wave of information and like uh, people and visibility. And it literally in our feeds, it was all black and you like couldn't find, you were not connected to anything. It was just, it was so counterproductive to like what it was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think that like, that's what, that's social media can really be our best friends and it can be can be our, our worst enemy as well. I love social media. I'm I'm mainly on uh, Instagram, but I love Instagram because I get to discover worlds that I know nothing about. And I get to like read about things that I don't know anything about. But also it's we need to keep in mind critical thinking. And I think that that's like the most Jewish thing for me. It's like my mind is always critically looking at things. I cannot take things in and be like, oh, this is the truth. It's important to look at different points of views and see where we sit and what makes sense. And if like the information is right and who's writing this information. I think a lot of people are just like using social media also as a as a ultimate source of information. And it's not. I use it as like, okay, I saw this article. Let me go online and see what everyone else is saying, if this makes sense or if it's true, or if it's not. Sometimes it's just like made up things. Sometimes it's true. So like really using our critical mind is like absolutely important <laughs> when addressing these type of things uh, and especially on social media. Right. I appreciate that. As, as social media in general, pros um, and cons, but I didn't realize that about the black box. And I do remember it um, mm. from that time. My tensions were so high. It was such a, a low point. And look, we're still very much in the aftermath, right? As a nation. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I want to give our audience a, a two minute warning that I'm going to take questions from you uh, in a moment. So everyone, please um, think about what they would like to ask Izu. My last question, um, you know, because I, I, I want to prioritize things. What is the most pressing thing for you? What, what is literally an issue surrounding race keeping you up at night? If you had to prioritize, is it representation? Is it um, police brutality? You know, what, what keeps you up at night about this? Oh my God, so much things keeps me up on I know. Uh, night. But I think that like what fa fascinates me the most is the lack of like critical thinking and mm -hmm. uh, the the will of like wanting to understand and read and learn and and like fill in the gaps of what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And I, I I don't like maybe it's because I went to school and like literally my whole degree was about like critical. Th I learned how to be a critical thinker mm -hmm. throughout college, but like being a critical thinker is absolutely necessary. And also uh, questioning ourselves with the things that we're learning are being mm -hmm. told. Um, I don't take everything I, I just like I question everything. Maybe it's a it's a bad thing at times, but it's literally like who wrote this and for what purpose? Like who is this serving and who is this going to to benefit to? So I that scares me because when I see things like you know when I see information about like anti-Semitism or like Israel that are just like widely spread without any type of kind of like okay, let me, let me read this. Like, let me try to find out where is this coming from? Who's speaking? What is this serving? And uh, we know that certain medias are there to serve certain ideas. And so mm. understanding that is like being able to, uh, I think a word that I learned in college with the market of ideas. And mm. you're supposed to have a market of ideas where you have a bunch of ideas and deciding, okay, what feels sound? Mm. Right? right. Because sometimes it's just not sound. And we have to try to figure out like what feels sound. And that scares me the most mm -hmm. because when I see really bad things happen, uh you you know, a lot of information is put out and and it's like people are so quick to use it and to just yeah like share it and spread it and it becomes this like I feel so overwhelmed because I'm just like this is just false information being widely spread and yeah. it terrifies me and so and so that's what keeps me out at night 
the lack of critical thinking. <laughs> okay, I appreciate that. I appreciate that candor. And um, I think it's great for all of us, right? To have that reminder to dissect things, you know, ourselves. Yeah. I'm gonna uh, read a few questions now that have been put in the chat and I would encourage everyone, um, you know, to put their questions in and I'll, I'll pick a few. Um, I like this one from Sarah Ryderband, who's here. Um, Izu, did you find yourself encountering what Robin DeAngelo describes as white fragility? Was that any part of what made this initial experience voyeuristic, uncomfortable? Did you eventually uncover why uh, white folks did not actively participate in initial conversations? So I guess if you could address white fragility. Yeah, I mean, I think that like a lot of the ideas that we can speak on through a simple conversation have turned into big words that like we need to step away from and try to understand. And I think white fragility is something that like shows up when someone feels like they don't, they don't have any space to, to like say what they have to say, or they think they have something to say. And it's like, it's, it's exhausting while you are experiencing something horrible. And so I, we, I experienced this while writing this book with Hannah and she admits to it. And I think that like, it's, it's a, it's something that I will forever experience. And I continue to experience. Unfortunately, I just learn how to say things in a way that someone can hear me without taking out facts and without uh, like watering down reality, the realities, right? But definitely uh, making it as as much as possible. Where like I'm, I'm trying to have a conversation with you, and if white fragility is too big in someone where there's no way of having a conversation, that's unfortunate. And I've also learned to be able to walk away from certain people or conversations that didn't feel like okay. There's no space for me to. There's no space for us to to have a uh, uh, a conversation and a lot of people are just not not they're they're not used to having a real conversation about things yeah I see okay I'm really glad um David and Vicki uh Brostrom asked the uh, following question because you do bring it up in your book a lot can you speak yeah. to the concept of microaggressions uh which make interracial communications potentially uncomfortable right uh, I think microaggression is basically, we talk about all this in the book, so I'm, I'm mm -hmm. excited that you guys are interested, but microaggression is passive aggressiveness in a way that is like so uncomfortable and so, so um, it's not a direct way, but it's, you, you feel it, you know it, you recognize it. And I feel it for when people talk about Jews or when people talk about like black people or when people talk about there, there's things that come directly to you and they're just like blunt and it's it's almost e easier to address that than to address microaggression because microaggression is is hidden under oh no but you know it, it's it's more under the belt so like you feel how do i even like how do I even address this? Because it's not directly like blatant racism, but it's it is aggressive and it is it feeds into like it triggers people and it makes people feel uncomfortable. But that's why it's so important to talk about like what like when something comes up, it's important when people want to like not everyone wants to address everything with everyone. But like I encourage people to always bring it up because if I'm going to be uncomfortable through that microaggression. I'm going to verbalize it so we both are uncomfortable in that moment because I can't I, I can't experience that discomfort yeah. like we're gonna have to be together in this moment and right. either address it or walk away from it but that's 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 how I see it at least mm -hmm. okay uh this is from Deborah Rubian she says thank you Izu in conversations I've had with friends and colleagues, we talk about the unaware space that white people take up. For example, white people speaking up first in a group, white people rephrasing for people of color. What are your thoughts about this? What do I as a white person need to hear and understand? Yeah, I think that, 
uh, the best way to see this is like in different in different moments. If like uh, you have people coming in and speaking on like anti-Semitism, since I assume most people here today are, are Jews, uh, if someone is, uh, if we're coming together to speak about anti-Semitism and you have a non-Jewish person coming in and taking a lot of space and speaking on things that they just wouldn't understand because they don't experience it because they haven't experienced it and so it's like the wisdom of being able to sit back and listen and learn and it and and it goes back to like wanting to hear and learn and not wanting to teach and take space when we genuinely just don't know we wouldn't know because we haven't experienced it's the same thing in a group of men and women if it's like a conversation on on feminism well Definitely men can participate, but the, it should be led and it should leave space for women to speak on what their experiences is as a woman. And that's just like, I think it's emotional intelligence of like knowing, okay, well, this is not, this is my, it's not my space to, to take space and to speak on things. Maybe it's a time for me to learn an opportunity to be more aware about something that you know, if I speak and I don't know, you won't even have the opportunity to hear what people have to say of what they experience. I love that. That's sort of in any realm, right? Let's not yeah, say we don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I'm going to combine a lot of questions here. So there's there's one theme. A lot of people are writing, well, what can I do? What actions mm -hmm. right now tangibly can I do? And then your teacher, one of your teachers, Rabbi April Davis, um, yeah says in the synagogue and Jewish community of your dreams, mm -hmm. what would that community be doing about racism within the group and larger society? So maybe by answering that second question in the ideal synagogue, what would we be doing would help mm -hmm. people understand what actions we can take? Right. I think that the ideal synagogue, I, I, I think that it's making space for having these conversation and not making it a point when something bad happens. I think a lot of people wait for a disaster or something really bad to happen in order to have a conversation. And I think that we have to normalize this, these conversations. Like people have to sit together and um, intersect in, uh, uh, in what they experience and what like through like direct conversation of, hey, like, I experience something bad, you, you create space to have that conversation when something bad happens, but also throughout you normalize exchange with visibility of people that come from different backgrounds. Because ultimately, if you have a room filled with people that come from very different backgrounds, whatever conversation you have, not necessarily on like uh, anti-Semitism or racism, you are going to have a perspective that is so much more in, like uh, uh, englobes more than one view and like kind of walks away from like the normal idea of what things are so it's two things it's like creating space to address when something bad happens right uh usually I'd say not someone that's in-house because in-house means you you can't bite the hand like the dynamic is not fair when someone from the organization is supposed to be the one who addresses something that happens in the organization uh, there's going to be a a fight in like um like uh it's just not going to be fair right and then also creating a space uh, throughout where we create visibility we create like diversity not solely based in trauma like just like anti-semitism we speak anti-Semitism, obviously it's always about, you know, the harm that's done to us as Jews, but also normalizing, integrating like a uh, culture that comes from Jewish uh, people is also creating a, a, a visual that's not only based in trauma, not only based in, 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 in horror, but also humanizing people. And ultimately that widens the, the view or the gaze that people have on said group of people, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It does. It does make sense. And it's a, it's also gives us sort of a beautiful, but realistic, right? Um, ideal view. Um, we have uh, two comments here about the word micro in front of aggression, as in, is there such thing as a micro, a smaller aggression? Is aggression just aggression? What is the toll um, it takes, you know, on a lifetime of people who have um, received this kind of aggression. What, what do you think of the term? And do you want to share, you know, some of your own experiences with this? 
Yeah, I think that microaggression, it's definitely not micro. <laughs> I think microaggression is defined through the type of comment that's given. So it feels like a soft attack, but it's an attack. You know, it's like when someone's like, oh, but you know, Jews are really like, they're running everything. They're really, you know, they, yeah. they have the power. It's right. like, that's a microaggression on Jewishness. It's like right. saying that is an anti-Semitic statement. Right. Because it's not necessarily, it's not true. And, and because it stems from anti-Semitic beliefs. So it's, it's, it's delivered in a soft way. Right. But it's very aggressive because ultimately you feel like, oh, I'm in presence with someone that is either doesn't realize that they're saying something anti-Semitic or is potentially really anti-Semitic. So it is a real aggression, but microaggression refers to the way it's delivered. And as a black person, it's like, oh, wow, you're really like, you're really smart. And it's like, okay. Right. You what know, it's like, mean? what yeah. is that? It's a statement that's, that's based in the fact that there's racist, anti-Semitic, uh, ideology connected to that uh but right. it it's delivered softly it's like it feels like a compliment right it's like jews they're everything they, they have all the power it's like it sounds like a compliment but it's not a compliment and then like oh you're really smart why am i why is it that this is a thing like that you're complimenting my intelligence is right. it because you don't think and that's why it's so hard to address microaggression because like then if I have a conversation with someone it's like what are you trying to say like why are you saying that Jews run the world are you saying are you anti-semitic and it's like no no it, it, it's right. ultimately like or oh what do you mean like do you think black people are not you know smart and so then it's harder right. than someone that's like oh I don't like black people or I don't like Jews or you right know, it's then, not as direct but it's there yeah it's but there. It, it's as it's almost more harmful because then you you a lot of us don't know how how do we address this like how do I bring it up especially in interpersonal relationship how do I bring this up that like well that was really problematic you know like uh, or that was racist so that was anti-semitic so yeah right right and you know I, I can only speak for myself when I've experienced anti-semitism micro or macro the mm -hmm. fear sets in yes uh, Am I safe around this person? How right. much danger am I in? Where's exactly. the nearest exit? What else do they think? Yeah. Um, and I appreciate you saying micro doesn't describe the aggression. It describes the way in which yes. this news it's delivered. Is yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think we've seen society go through this with gender norms. You throw well for a girl, right? Mm -hmm. You know, for a girl, you sure, you know, do X. And so um, you know, the, the collective guilt there, as you said, sort of touches all the, um, you know, different minorities. Right. Okay. I, I hate to do this, but we're going to take one more question. This has been posted twice. So, um, <laughs> let me see. Um, uh, Marina put, put this uh, for us from Facebook. So the term allyship, uh, feels like saviorism and checking a box for me. I don't think it's enough. Have we found another term? I feel like we let a lot of people off the hook in a sense. Uh, what about an advocate, a freedom fighter, uh, which is from the civil rights movement, addresses mm -hmm. accountability and responsibility, gets a little bit closer uh, for me than ally. What, what do you right. think about that? I, I'm one of these people that like, I'm, I'm, my school of thought is like, I don't really care for like the specific word to a specific ideology right it's really about like what are you doing like it doesn't matter if I call you an advocate or an activist or an ally at the end of the day is like are you actually in that life of trying to rep repair and restore and as Jews we understand that like it's tikkun olam we understand what tikkun olam is and we have to see uh, fighting against racial issues, anti-Semitism as the same thing. Even if we are not directly the cause of these issues, even if we don't have the power to change everything, I really want people to read this book and to hear my words, to understand that like I'm trying to ins uh, install um, like power in individuals. Like I want people to re understand that like you are able to make a change in your own way, in your own space. I like, but it has to be done. It has to be done in today because things are not well for any minority. And we really need to like 
be together, address things together. And so I I said like small things will make greater changes. And it's, you know, is your town, um, what's the diversity with the teachers? Like, have you had conversation with like what type of teachers are in the school? Like, what are the, the students learning? I think like all of these things are small, small things that are just like, it feels small, but it affects our environment and it affects our society as a, as a, as a greater means. And so that's, that's, that's why I wrote this book. It's like, I really want people to remove themselves from that frozen and toxic um, perfectionism and really understand that they can make a difference in their own way from, you know, their own community in their own house. So, yeah. Beautiful. And I, I want to remind everybody, this is the book. We can all listen to Easy Talk forever. It was articulate and eloquent. This is her book, uh, Real Friends, you know, talk about race and Izu. I just, and it's in the chat, the link uh, to buy the book, but I have to thank you. You're joining us from Paris. You're extremely busy. You remembered your central synagogue community and we appreciate it um, so much and having this opportunity to learn from you, um, yeah. just invaluable. So we're putting your podcast link in the chat, the link to buy the book. Um, and of course, if anybody would like to contact Izu, please um, be in contact with me and we can make uh, the match. Yeah. But I just thank you so very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Rabbi Rubin. I appreciate this conversation. I'm so amazed by all the people that showed up. It's so cool. And I hope that like uh, this book really inspires people and really feel like they can be part of like the conversations that we're having. Um, I'm at, yeah, through Rabbi Rubin, you can reach me. I also have an Instagram. Um, there's a kinswoman Instagram and there's also my personal Instagram, which is Izu, uh, Y-S-E-U, L-T-N-Y-C, where you can write me if you want to write me. And um, so, yeah. Incredible. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your thank story you with so us much. and your beautiful book. Yes. Well, everybody. Thank, you so thank, you. thank you for joining us. Bye. Bye-bye.